thank you all for joining our call this morning, The Essential Ingredients Required for People to Organize the Social Change, featuring Rakesh Rajani, Director at the Ford Foundation. We also have on this call Dr. Liungai Mbilini, who was also the General Secretary of Daikota, and I'd like to, she will um, introduce the speaker. Before we go over to Dr. Bellini for the introduction of the speaker, we'd just like to say thank you all for joining us this morning. I think we will have a lovely, lively discussion. Um, the call will be approximately one hour. We intend to end this call at 12. That we will start with the introduction of the speaker, followed by the speaker uh, giving us um, the, the discussion of the, the topic of the day. We will then open up the call for Q&A, so you'll have an opportunity to, to ask some questions of the speaker and have an opportunity to just have a dialogue. Post that, um, we will then close the call. So without further ado, I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Mbilini to introduce our speaker. Dr. Mbilini? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jessica Santesana. Just making sure that you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Asante Jessica for continuing to coordinate this very critical um, virtual seminar series. Dakota's webinars have really connected us Tanzanians and friends of Tanzania in the diaspora with um, just a myriad of resources and services as well as knowledge um, all at our fingertips, um, whether we are connecting via computer, a tablet, iPad, etc., or a telephone. So thank you again. And today, as Jessica said, it's uh, really an absolute honor and pleasure for me to introduce Rakesh Rajani, who wears many hats and whose work, volunteerism, and outreach has impacted and continues to impact an entire continuum from um, sort of the micro-individual level all the way to the macro, community, government, and policy levels. Um, so it's really um, a pleasure for me to do this. Rakesh uh, currently is the Director of Democratic Participation and Governance at the Ford Foundation in New York. He has done uh, many other things um, prior to that, including uh, leading to AWESA, which is an East African organization that promotes citizen agency, open government, and basic education. He's also one of the founders and past co-chair of the Open Government Partnership, which encompasses about 65 countries reaching 2 billion people or more. Uh, about 10, year, 10 to 15 years ago, Rakesh was the founding executive director of Haki Elimu, Tanzania's leading citizen engagement and education advocacy organization. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure many of you have uh, seen a lot of coverage of this work. Um, and really Rakesh's leadership and reach extends through the many boards he has served globally and papers he has published in both English and Kiswahili. And these are just examples. We could, we could share even more than this. Um, through all that, Rakesh's popularity and all the educational accolades that he's achieved, including from Harvard University, he has still remained very humble and um, down to earth. If you can allow me right now to just end my introduction of our speaker today with um, a very brief personal experience. For me at an individual level, I've had the privilege of knowing Rakesh for almost uh, 20 years now. I first met Rakesh while I was a graduate student in Minnesota in the mid 90s and we first connected virtu virtually by email. Um, at the time I was working on a research paper that had relevance to one of Rakesh's expertise and he happened to be a colleague and friend of my mother, Professor Marjorie Bellini. And I have to say, uh, I haven't forgotten the way that Rakesh took time out of his already very busy schedule to give me countless feedback on various reiterations of my paper when he really could have easily said, eh, Samahani, I'm really busy and um, with his schedule. Um, and I, am, I know I'm just one of thousands and thousands that Rakesh has impacted um, over the years, both um, personally and otherwise. 
And that is just who Rakesh is impacting global social change at the individual and community level, really no matter what it takes. So today, we really all have the privilege to hear some of the key lessons that Rakesh has learned that are truly essential for any and all of us to organize for social change. So without further ado, Karib sana Rakesh Rajani. Thank you so much for, for that introduction and thank you Jessica for organizing this. Um, I'm really glad to, to be doing this together with you and see how we can think and learn together. Um, so Asante Nithana. Do we do an introduction? Is that how, how does the procedure work? Nianze au kwanza tunatambulishana? Nathani unaweza kuingia tu katika conversation alafu ukisha maliza tutafungua mkutano ili watu waweze kukuuliza maswali. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Asantani Tana and thank you folks for taking uh, uh, your time on Saturday Saturday morning. So I wanted to do two things. Uh, one is just give a quick context of, uh, of, uh, of this in terms of what's happening back home in Tanzania uh, and, then, and then share with you very quickly just seven ideas for, for organizing and, and, uh, and then we open it up. Um, so, and, and I'm going to, for the purposes of um, time and so forth, I'm going to be in some ways oversimplifying some points rather than going into all the, all the nuance because that would take too long. So if you, if you look um, uh, back home, uh, what's going on, right? We, we have a ruling party that has been in, it is the longest serving ruling party in Africa. Um, no other no other country has had a, a power a, a party in power for as long, and what it tries to do is to one stay in power. That's objective number one, uh, and do everything necessary to stay in power. And then once in power, its aim is to use that position to 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 get resources and to be able to then distribute those resources to people. Uh, uh, on, on a good day to do it uh, on the benefit of all people. Uh, if you're a cynic, you say they do it uh, more for themselves and in a way to perpetuate power. And the reality is probably a combination of those two things. Uh, and that's what people, uh, parties in power and, and regimes in power do all over the world, including, including the US. So, so that's basically what you have. Amass power, get into power and distribute uh, resources to, to people. What does the opposition do? The opposition has taken on uh, a, a watchdog role and its main function seems to be to point out the faults uh, of government, to point out the corruption in government, uh, to embarrass the government. Um, and the idea is that if they do that enough, the Wananchi will get tired of uh, seeing how government is and they will vote, uh, vote them out and give power to the opposition. And the opposition essentially says that if we were in charge, we would not be as bad as the current government um, in charge. So that's basically what they try to, what they have been trying to do. Um, the third uh, category here, you could talk about uh, civil, you know, civil society. Um, and in civil society, you have kind of a variation there, but you can maybe simplify that into terms of three categories. One is there's watchdogs uh, in civil society who, who do a little bit like opposition. They, they don't want to be in power, but they also believe that if we, if we, if we tell the truth like it is, if we, if we show, for example, that maybe the government is not... Uh, uh, implementing things as per its policies or these things are going wrong, uh, that what will in fact happen is the government will, will, the pressure will make the government behave itself because what on Aibuku and what Abalisha Tabiazao so that uh, they will behave themselves better. Um, and so the embarrassment of being in the media and so on. So that's one view. And one type. Another type is the kind of more awareness building educational types where they believe that to uh, keep Hamasisha Jami on the important things anti corruption or HIV AIDS or environment or women's rights or young people's rights. So, you know, take your issue. But to uh, keep Hamasisha on Ainchi, then people somehow will be aware. Uh, if you push harder 
and try to uncover the theory of change there, you find that uh, it, it, if we, it, it essentially kind of is this, you know, what Freire talked about, the kind of, uh, you know, pouring, uh, pouring, uh, pouring intelligence or knowledge into empty heads uh, model. That is, somehow it ends up being kind of lecturing, it kind of assumes people don't know, uh, wako ignorant, ujinga, to, if we, if to kiwa basi, then somehow things will be fine. Uh, it tends to be not not very well analyzed in, in many cases. Um, and then the third the third category of civil society are, are the miradi, is essentially recognizing that the state has failed to deliver health or education, or water or security, um, and um, uh, let us fill those gaps, either because government is failing to do so, or maybe because it's not government's job, but people need it. Uh, take care of the orphans, take care of poor people. Uh, and so, basically, these projects uh, seek to seek to give services to people and take care of people. Um, uh, and you know, I could go on with some other categories: media, uh, business, and so on. But but I won't again for the sake of time, because you could you could argue that with those other three other media and business, and they have other objectives. But at least for the ruling party, the opposition the civil society, they all claim to be there for the benefit of the people. What you notice in the way that I've painted this story is that the, it's all about people, but it's about all about what is done to people. Uh, the people here are not active agents. They are in many ways just the recipients. They are you know, when you think of people, you don't think of them as being active or having uh, minds and hearts and wanting to move things. You see them as wapokeaji of the actions. And basically, the ruling party and the opposition and the civil society are all in some ways uh, competing in the market to say, we are the ones who truly can do better for the people. Uh, you know, the other guys say so, but in a sense, what we're doing is, is most important. Um, but it is done for people on their behalf to them rather than done by by the people. Uh, for those of you, for example, who are familiar with uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's work, if you manage to get through that brilliant but very hard to read book, Citizen and Subject, um, here the it's it's not citizen, people are, you know, it's it's the subjects, people are, are, are really the subject here. Um, and what you if, if you look, if you were to put verbs uh, among people, what you see is either kaziao ni kuomba, make a long list of maita yetu, uh, and you know we need this, we need this. Sisi maskini atunaiki atunaiki jamani mone huruma mtusaidia, and another role is kupokea the largest. So takrima and so forth during elections, but also if you if you talk to a member of parliament in Tanzania, whether the ruling party or opposition, they'll tell you that a lot of their job is 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 people go and tell them their problems and, and the job of the MP is to is to dish out. Um, and if if this doesn't happen, um, then your the the action uh, from the Wananchi is Kulalamika. Uh, Kulalamika that uh, this 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 king, whether whatever kind of king it is, is is not uh, taking care of things. And and I, of, so you can see, I'm of course deeply oversimplifying. But I think I, I, but I think the essential truth is that we have over the last fifty years, despite Uhuru, we have in effect uh, reinforced this basic message that people are to receive and somebody else. Uh, whether whether the political process or or, or civil society uh, has to take care of us, so Mindeleo is is about taking care of, taking care of us. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that I think if we look at history, our own history and the history of many other countries, uh, this is not a model that will succeed. And we, that we need to move from a politics of ruling and a politics of grievance to a politics of governance and a politics of participation, uh, where people uh, take responsibility and initiative for for moving things forward. Again, if there was more time, we could we could look at the history of all the major. You know, if briefly, for example, even if you think of what 
think if you stop and say what are some of the major advances we have made in the last hundred years in the world uh, you could point to the women's rights movement you could point to liberation in uh, against colonialism you could talk about uh, liberation from apartheid you could talk about the LGBT movement about the environmental movement uh, all of, take any of the major advances that have been made uh, in the world and I think you will see that they happened not because the kings took care of things for us, whether the kings were the ruling party or the opposition kings or the or the NGO kings. Things happened when people themselves were organized and essentially said uh, we need the, 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 the order of the day is not acceptable. He has an alternate vision and we must have that happen. Uh, so my what I what I'm saying to you is that Tukitaka uh, Maendeleo, Tukitaka Ukombozi, it'll it'll need people to organize themselves rather than waiting for somebody else to do things for them. Uh, and um, I have been from the days in which I was I was in college where I looked where I studied poor people's organization in Latin America to all the work I've done. Uh, with with social justice in the US working with homeless people working on other issues here as well as working in Tanzania at Kuleana, Akelimu, Tuaweza and global level work like on the open government partnership and others the here are some seven seven quick lessons I want to share with you around what it takes to to organize and as I do this uh, I invite you to think about uh, what you are involved with or what you see being happening back home in Tanzania or, or in other countries and try to see uh, against the criteria that I'm about to lay out uh, what do you how, how would you rate what what government is doing what opposition is doing what civil society is doing so number one while the whole emphasis I'm making is about people organizing the first point I want to say is that people don't just spontaneously organize. It's not just as if the masses, the millions, just somehow start taking action. It needs leadership. And leadership is not, not somebody who is anointed, uh, comes from the right tribe or the right uh, elite background, but it's about people taking initiative. Uh, so nothing happens without some people who say, we must do something about this and we will take initiative even though it's hard or, or nobody has asked us so we don't really know what we're doing but somebody comes together and takes charge takes initiative to make things happen so that's quality number one and and what is in what is maybe the deeper word there is takes responsibility who kind of sees that where that I know things are not going well, but things are not going well not only because those ten other people are, uh, you know, are doing something wrong, but things are not going well because I or we have not taken, have not done something about it. Uh, so, in in other words, it's a way of saying when you see problems, start by looking in the mirror. Change begins with us. I am responsible. So the key deep point here is that that individual, that group of individuals, that group of people takes responsibility for the state of affairs and says we can do something about it and we will. That's what I call leadership, responsibility and initiative. Point number two is you have to begin with where people are and the issues that people care about. You don't say to uh, Tashugukiya because uh, USAID has issued a, a call for proposals. Uh, you don't say that we must work on climate change because that is now the sexy issue of the day. It might be the, you know, you work on climate change if that's what you find people truly care about. So you really have to begin with issues that resonate to people's lives. Now this sounds so obvious, it seems like not worth saying, but you would be surprised as to how many times uh, people do things and frame things in ways that don't begin with what people's priorities are um, and what people's, uh, you know, what people really are passionate about or concerned about on the ground. So that's the that's the second point. And and whatever you are proposing, whether it is it is political engagement or education or whatever you you need to take that thing you are proposing and link it and show that it's connected to what people care about. The third point 
is well, if, if you have to start with what people care about, the most important thing you need to do is listen. Now again, this sounds so simple, but uh, most politicians, uh, whether government or opposition, and most civil society people, uh, we don't listen. We assume that we know what is needed and we talk, we explain. Uh, we educate. The, the image is the, that the people are suffering because there's a, there's a Ujinga Fulani. Uh, there's ignorance of a certain kind. And we, because we are educated, or because we are in parliament, or because we are the executive director, Tunajua, and we start explaining to them uh, what, what needs to happen. Um, and, and, uh, and if you think of our tropes, uh, listening is something you, when you take, imagine, look around at the pictures of uh, Kikwete, Magufuli, Mkapa, uh, you know, think of, uh, think of the other leaders, regional commissioners, district commissioners, think of opposition uh, people, uh, uh, you know, think of uh, Mbowe and uh, think of the, the others that we know, even, even my friend Zito, do you see them do, do the photographs you see of them, uh, do the postures you see of them uh, show listening? Do the stories they tell you, tell you the stories that of, I look, this is what I learned. Yanis kujua lakini au nina hamu sana, nina kiu kutaka kusikiliza, kujifunza, kuelewa zaidi kwa sawa si jui. Na ningependa kujielimisha kwa kuasikiliza kwa nainchi. And, and, you know, in order to listen, you can't just pop in and pop out. Uh, it can't be transactional. It can't be instrumental. There has to be some sense of trust and confidence that people have that you're listening because you care, uh, not just because you want to then say you listened. Uh, you know, it's just like in, it's just like in relationships, uh, just like in, if you, if you think of your friends or your, or your or your husbands and wives and, and your colleagues at work and others, it's, you can tell what is instrumental listening and what is real listening. Um, so our politics does not have that, does not have that uh, picture. Now, whereas, uh, whereas I think you see, at least on the democratic side here, for example, in this country, you see that this is a trope that, that is emphasized. Uh, uh, you can, I, can, I can give you dozens of photographs of, of of Obama, for example, where he, what he's doing is he's listening, not not pontificating. Fourth point um, uh, is the if you look again at history, the the change cannot be individuals. We often like to tell stories of individual heroes and heroines, uh, um, but but change is about people coming together, about collective action. Uh, it's not just the kind of individual hero who goes out and makes things happen. And in order for us to come together, we need to have an identity. We need to have a collective identity. We need to have a sense of belonging. Yeah. In many of the countries where we come from, um, in many of the regions where we come from, the easiest identity is, is an ethnic one. Mimi ni mskuma, mimi ni mnyamwezi. Um, at least those are the traditional ones. And I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. It can be very important. Uh, but there are also other identities that we have, and usually, in, in, and increasingly so, we have multiple identities. Uh, I can be a mskuma, but I can also be a Muslim, and I can also be an IT expert, and I can also be somebody who is part of a group that deeply cares about the environment, uh, and I can be a fan of Liverpool, and so on and so forth. But we need to have a sense of belonging that, uh, that, that, that connects us uh, together. And, and my sense is that uh, civil society, for example, is not very good at that, uh, at, at, um, at building that sense. It becomes very transactional, it becomes a workshop, it becomes something you do on that issue, but people, we don't understand what, if you just think of the word belonging, what gives somebody a sense of belonging? That I belong, I matter, these are my people, uh, I enjoy being with them, they will have my back. Fifth is once you have belonging and a sense of identity and you have what issues, you've established what the issues are, you've established a sense of you then need to show a pathway of action. 
you need to be able to show that uh, that we are together and we care but this is what we can do that is worth doing you don't have to promise guaranteed results in fact you shouldn't because often there are not guaranteed results but we need to be able to see in GIA we need to be able to see a map okay we can move from here to there in these ways and it is worth doing uh, and we can do that that pathway has to be real a lot of I think what is proposed by civil society is not real it's just a workshops and seminars and so on and no wonder why people insist on sitting allowances because they don't believe in the pathway they don't believe in that action they just think we should sit together um, so it has to be real uh, real doesn't mean guaranteed uh, it means that there's a, there's a hope uh, that there's a, there's a hopefulness to this. So building hope is very important. A collective, uh, grounded in reality, but but hope. Uh, and I think what is also very important is that there should there needs to be an open discussion of the potential risks. That if we do this, uh, you know, maybe the the powers that be may not like it. Uh, we may be arrested. Uh, we may. Uh, or we may lose out on that contract, or we may, you know, the, uh, those social ties that are very important may be cut or may be frayed. Um, and there has to be an open discussion of the risks, and people need to collectively decide which risks they are willing to take or not take. Um, and again, a lot of the time, I think people are not willing to talk openly about those risks and engage people and I think it's an it's a sacred obligation that if you are trying to talk with people about doing something you need to talk about not only the opportunity but about the risks and how the risks can be managed and and in a way let people decide uh, whether they are willing to take that risk or not my sense is that many people once they understand the risks and come together and they believe in the pathway unless the risks are really huge are actually willing to willing to take them and in some cases some people are even willing to take the risks when when they are very very large um, final two points um, is that that pathway of action look they are depending on what you're trying to do and uh, uh, and achieve it, it'll it'll map it'll be it'll vary it could be something very small and short term it can be something very long and deep which will take decades so it, it varies but in one way or another, what I want to put forward to you is that it has to involve a notion that we want to make government work better for people. Whether you're talking about Serikali uh, Amta, Kijiji, whether you're even talking about just something very small like Kamatia Shule, Kamatia Ulinzi, or you are talking about something very large, such as you know your national government, or even 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 global governance, uh, are, you know, whether it's something like the United Nations or the global regime on on how multinational taxation is managed, or something of that sort. It doesn't. Whichever level of government you're talking about, I think the key needs to be that we need to focus on how government can work better for us, rather than. Uh, in a sense, could, could just do things aside. In you know, a chanana serikali will just do things our, ourselves. And the reason I emphasize that is that ultimately, if you don't do that, it is not a sustainable solution. Um, you you again, if you look historically, that's that's often found to be the case. That you know, it's it's maybe different in places where governance is broken down completely, where you your form of governance is outside the capital F formal government or capital G government uh, uh, places places like uh, Somalia maybe but even in Somalia what you find is it's governance institutions that people are building even though they may not be part of the formal structure that is ordained um, in, in short what I'm trying to say is that throughout history people sustainably solve problems by making government work better for them rather than rather than ignoring government and this is really important especially in today's world where there's a, I think an overplay on social entrepreneurship uh, you know if we just Silicon Valley and so on. Silicon Valley does uh, and things of that, that kind of bring lots of innovation and so on but all of that if you look carefully for people who studied it would never have happened if governance didn't work the reason Silicon Valley works is there's all kinds of rules around patents and safety and uh, 
and contracts that get respected and so on and so forth. There's a whole regulatory structure. I'm not saying it works very perfectly, but without that regulatory structure, you wouldn't. In fact, you could argue that one of the reasons innovations happen more in the U.S. compared to other countries is because precisely because there's rule of law and there's a relatively better governance structure here than in other parts of the world. Uh, and finally, uh, what is very important in you, in, as you embark in this is to, is, to, is to have the humility right from the beginning to understand that uh, you don't have all the answers. Uh, even if you've done all your homework, it may go wrong. Um, so you always have to continually learn. You have to ask yourself uh, all the time, how will we know that what we're doing is working? Uh, how will we know what we need to change? And you need to develop, you have to start with that attitude of humility, you have to have a, a, a culture that is, that is open to learning, open to admitting that, hey, may, maybe I was wrong, we were wrong, both in terms of the practical things but also about the ideology, also about your deep values, you, you know, maybe you thought that uh, uh, if all you had to do was give, put put poor people in, in positions of power and everything will work and maybe you find out no, when they're in power they just replicate what the previous kings used to do and then you might need to change your ideology. So uh, that is really, really important as, as well. So to, you need to be able to uh, have that posture, you need to develop mechanisms to get feedback uh, in a systematic way and analyze that information and then finally make the adaptations that you need to do. Uh, and you need to, you, and that learning can happen both within your project or your country, but also from others. So there has to be a deep intellectual curiosity to want to look at how other societies, other groups, other people in our own country and other countries have learned and, and be able to know how to incorporate that knowledge. So that's the seventh and final uh, lesson. And um, let me stop here. Uh, I really thank you for listening and I look forward to the discussion. I guess that was very powerful. Um, definitely, it just makes you realize that there's so much you can do. But one thing that stood out for me in your speech was when you talked about the whole listening skill and then also being willing to learn and change your views based on the information you provide. So thank you very much for that. I will now open up the... Um, session so that the participants can, if you could introduce yourself and then ask your question. So I'm going to take you off mute. Okay. If, can, are your lines open? Hello, is there anybody that would like to ask a question? I have taken you off mute, so Karibuni. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you Rakesh for that uh, wonderful uh, talk. Uh, I think personally I'm, I'm on the same page with you on um, all of these points. They are, they are straightforward, they are, they are things that I I personally believe in so there's, there's not much in terms of uh, the points themselves but uh, one point that you pointed out is a pathway of action here and I, I'm going to link that I was talking on uh, we have a, a sort of like an online talk show uh, where we get together on Monday evenings and one of our friends from Maryland uh, organized this and we, we discussed things uh, back home. So this Monday I called in and I was talking about the, the very point you mentioned, the last point about humility. And uh, my, my input was that, because I, I was criticizing the, the current administration back home a lot. And the uh, presenter asked me, what would you uh, tell the current administration if you had the chance to sit with the president. And my point was the same point you mentioned, the, 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 the humility point. Uh, my, my, my question is how 
do we get somebody like Magufuli, who is, uh, 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 he's, he's, uh, he has good intentions in, in so many uh, ways, but the implementation lacks a sense of humility from, from my, my, my viewpoint. And it, it, in, in doing so, you, you, you get to a point where Magufuli doesn't even read the speech. You see? He just says whatever is on his mind. And sometimes by doing so, he contradicts government policy and embarrasses the presidency. And it becomes to, to somebody like, like like myself who is uh, very keen on words, and I I, I, I take uh, you know every word to be very meaningful. To have a, a president who contradicts uh, the anti-corruption uh, war, for example, is very disheartening. So how how do we organize ourselves? To make somebody who's as powerful and as influential, and, and maybe there's this uh, there's this euphoria that is sweeping the country now. People do not analyze things at a deeper level. How do we make government responsible, and to, uh, how do we make it humble at that point? That's it for me for now. Oh, Rakesh, are you still there? Okay, now now you've unmuted me. Okay. Uh, do you I'm want me to take a, respond to a question at a time? Uh, yes, I think it would be good if we could, if you could respond to one question at a time. And the last speaker, if you could just identify yourself so he can address you by name in his response. My name is Arthur. Arthur Luhigo. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, and thank you, Arthur. Good to hear your voice again. Um, um, I, 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 I see your point very much. I do think that um, that I, you know, I share your concern around this belief that both the president himself seems to have, the people around him, and the country have that. You know, it's all about him, and 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 there's a kind of over dependence on on the president. I, I, I also am concerned about that. So, what can you say? Let me let me answer by giving two answers. One is, you know, uh, for those people in that inner circle who trust the president, uh, and more importantly, who, who the president trusts. Um, if that was the case, if I had his ear, I would give him that kind of uh, feedback, uh, and say, say the leadership does not mean uh, you have to take. Leadership does not is not the same as you have to come up with all the answers. Um, you a good leader is one who sets a frame and then, uh, in a sense, creates a frame for other people to come up with the advice and the and the answers. So that's what I would say to him if I was somebody who had his ear. Now I think the issue here is that very few people have the president's ear, um, and 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 in the longer term, you know, the problem with 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 this approach is. Many of us think if we are just if we were just close to the president, if we could just get him to do what we think is important, then life will be good. Uh, I remember with the, with the previous president with uh, with, with Kikwete. Uh, at some level, I, at one point, I also when I did have access to him, I did also feel that uh, you know if I spoke to him and he did, he did what I advised him, it would work. Um, I advised him, he agreed, and some of it worked, but most of it did not work. What I'm trying to say is that part of the it's, um, part of part of what is really important here is to for even ourselves to, to to think of the world ordered not just around the presidency. Uh, you know, you, we hear a lot about Magufuli, but if you go to where most Tanzanians live and if you look at day-to-day -day lives, uh, the president in some ways is neither here nor there. And so, what I think. In order to, in answer, in answer to your question, what should be done, my sense is that most of the time we should focus on more local forms of government and how we can model and practice there what it is we want. Start with, start with the school head teacher. Uh, start with, uh, if you're a member of your church uh, or your Islamic group, uh, start there. Um, start, uh, you know, in, in modeling that if you have children with your, in your own families. Uh, if you are part of an organization, if you're part of an NGO, do it, do it there. And my sense is that the more we populate our society with models of governance that are different, 
and that are powerful and vibrant but not based on the kind of father knows best approach. Uh, that's, that's how you build civil society. It's very hard to shortcut moja kwa moja if you don't have that deep civil society uh, experience and practice that's a different model. And I think that's our problem in Tanzania that in a sense um, even if you go to NGOs, you go to whichever level, you know, you have, magu, you have smaller magufuli uh, uh, running the situation. So uh, let's start small and, and maybe that will give us the basis to make a bigger point further down the line. And that actually resonates with me as well, just from just from working in the corporate environment. A lot of times the CEO of our company will say something, but when you really want to know whether or not people are actually taking action, it really comes down to the middle or lower level managers who are actually the ones that need to be enforcing it. So they actually hold a lot more power, potentially, than even what the directors that seem to be coming from the top, so that definitely resonates with me. Any other questions? Have you Buni? Rakesh, I actually had one question. When you initially started your discussion, you were going through different areas that have an impact, and you talked about the media, but you didn't get into a lot of details on the media, how the media impacts. Would you be able to sort of explain that further? No, I mean, I, I think we have a, we have a real crisis um, uh, with media. On one hand, uh, um, this guy, it's a little hard because there's somebody who, there's a lot of noise I'm hearing. Um, uh, I wonder whether somebody could mute themselves. Oh. Yes, you can self-mute. If you, if you could self-mute, that would help. Somebody I've unmuted you so that you can ask questions, but please do self-mute to reduce the background noise. Thank you. Um, Okay, let me try this and then go back. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's that's better. Okay, so let me let me. So I think media is absolutely essential. Media is how uh, how people get to know what's happening in the world in their own country. Media is where you hear ideas. That's essentially how how information and ideas flow and where debates can happen. So any any society that has that. Uh, it doesn't have it is in is in real trouble. The the problem we have, I think, is that uh, that the incentives within media, and whether we are talking about Tanzania or many other countries, including most of the U.S., is that what sells is a certain kind of sensationalism, uh, and what it is doing is that in in the past, essentially, media was often subsidized in various ways and the competition was less so that you would have the sensationalism but you would have other things because essentially in many ways media was seen as a public good and, and there were subsidies. Now when you don't have that um, what you have is that that media kind of reinforces uh, some of the worst uh, or, the, or the most problematic tendencies we have in ourselves. The, the emphasis on just the big leaders, the focus on scandals, the the kind of um, simple thinking, the lack of nuance, um, the kind of uh, cheap patriotism. Uh, whether you're talking about Donald Trump or John Magufuli, there's a way in which uh, you it's it what sells is a cheap patriotism. Uh, whenever people are are struggling, uh, the easiest target throughout history has always been to blame somebody else. Uh, Again, whether it is Mexican immigrants here, or whether it is the Jews in Europe, or whether it is uh, you know uh, various kinds of foreigners or, or opposition in, in Tanzania. So, and and media can fuel all of that. Um, so for me, uh, a, a challenge we have is how do we build the institution of a free and independent media that is able to present ideas with thoughtfulness and nuance. Um, 
how how do you do that? Um, and 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 uh, what is tricky is you know we we know that that won't sell. Uh, people don't pay to consume thoughtfulness. Uh, people pay to consume scandal. So that is why I, I think I think it can't just be uh, we can't just go with the market so to speak. Uh, but investments in 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 media that promote that thoughtfulness are important. And again, if the question is that the responsibility begins with us, um, you know, there are at least two questions we can ask ourselves. One is, uh, if we believe in the, that it is essentially, it is essential and vital to a free society to have a free media, uh, what are we willing to pay? Especially those of us on this call who can, you know, we can afford this. Are we, are we willing to pay for media? Or do we also want it, uh, you know, free? Uh, do we want a good without paying for it? Uh, and the other is, many of us uh, have been fortunate enough to to have had experiences and education that allow us to write. Uh, and and do we write? Do we write in a thoughtful way? Uh, do we read and do we read the thoughtful stuff? And do we write the thoughtful stuff? And at some level. Uh, we are going to get the media we deserve. Uh, so if 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 we are if we kind of reduce our thinking to the short Facebook posts, and if we ourselves get consume the scandal, and we are not willing to read and to spend and pay for and also take the time to write ourselves, in some ways we are going to then create the thoughtless society that you know you know we will deserve that thoughtless society because. Sisi Wenyewe have, in a way, did not do anything to, to make it different. So I think that's the challenge we face with, with media today. Ashante, it's just a reminder, Congo, we need to have our own critical thinking. None of there's so much information we can consume, and it sounds like we need to be thoughtful about that. I do have a question from the floor from Patrick Negula. Patrick, your line is open. Would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it? Okay. This question is, is our adult education system working in Tanzania? <laughs> ah, it is, that's a truly important question and a truly sad story. I mean, we, uh, as you know, as part of, um, part of the the kind of transformation, post-independence transformation that uh, Mwalimu believed in very strongly uh, in, this, in the late 60s and 70s after Education for Self-Reliance in 1967. Um, this, is, this is work that uh, Liu's mother, Marjorie Bellini, has worked on very deeply uh, around adult education. Is, this, is, this is crucial because adult education the whole premise that I was talking to you about earlier on what it takes to organize uh, is essentially what the adult education pro process was about, about people, including people who maybe had not been to school, uh, you know, who are quote-unquote illiterate, um, who are able to come together, uh, understand their situation, analyze the situation, and take collective action. That's what the promise of adult education was. And we did make, we did make uh, some progress. I think what went wrong is, is in a sense, the, the, the limits of a centrally organized state, which even though the rhetoric was bottom up, in practice was top down, uh, uh, corrupted the process. So two things happened. Is one, that the, the deeper concept of adult education, which was about ukombozi, uh, became just about uh, you know, uh, literacy and numeracy of the most basic kind, uh, and then it was just about chetty. So it all became about we're just going to teach you enough for you to pass the test so that you uh, know chetty. And and the whole it was stripped of its deeper purpose. Um, and when it was stripped and corrupted like that, people realized there isn't much value for it, and so on. And so it, it kind of fizzled out. And then once in the late 70s, once the oil price crisis hit in our in our economy back home. Got into got into trouble. Uh, one of the first things to suffer was adult education, and I think we've never recovered from the early 80s the disinvestment and corruption in adult education. So today, the short answer to your question is: I don't think we have any adult education program that's of any meaning to worth speaking about. 
Um, and all our focus has gone into kind of primary and secondary education. Um, and But I'm also not one who says, let's expand adult education, because I think in the current uh, institutional and political climate, if we expanded adult education, it would just be another big program with lots of uh, training and, and, and institutions and buildings and so forth. And I'm not sure all that money and investment and time would have would result in much of a difference because of the ways in which we frame adult education now. So I, I think the short answer is it's not happening, but I'm not quite sure what the way forward is in terms of adult education. Now, we, we may want to do the same thing, but, but in different ways and through different institutions. Okay. We have a question from David and Rema. David, your line is open so you can ask your question. Carry with David. We can't hear you. Okay, so while we wait um, to see if we could get David's audio working. Um, is there anybody else that would like to ask a question? We probably have time for about one or two more questions. Your lines are open, so Karibuni. Sante sana. Napa nchu, napa nongea, sika wa mnansikia. Napa nchu, napa Asante sana. Thank you so much, Rakesh, again for your, for speaking to us and for sharing uh, your immense knowledge on this. Uh, I'm sorry I came in a little bit late, so I might have missed the beginning. But I wanted to, you know, talk about or ask about how we, you know, we can or citizens can bring change through the judicial system. Uh, you know, I think we don't see as many. Uh, whether it's citizens or organizations or uh, civil society or even political parties taking the right, the path of finding justice or changing things by uh, challenging uh, certain things to be upheld, which you know already provided in our constitution, for example. And and I'm thinking of of somebody like Ntikila, you know, Reverend Ntikila may. God rest his soul in peace. You know, he he, you know, chose to fight through the judicial system for various things to be upheld that were already provided, or you know, finding a constitutional interpretation of of various rights through the courts. Um, recently, you know, we saw uh, Mschana Initiative with uh, a young girl called Rebecca Gumi. Who decided to challenge the uh, child marriage law? So, you know, my, my, my question is, you know, first, why don't we see more of that, and uh, what are the what are the challenges, and how can we make, uh, you know, citizens, you know, instead of complaining, you know, go through the court to to seek their justice. Great question, Nathan. Uh, I think uh, I have a kind of a three three part answer. The first is you're absolutely right. A lot of the progress that has been made in the world is made through judicial activism, or what you might call um, strategic litigation. Right? So, in in this country, for example, uh, uh, the whole civil rights movement, if you look at it, was essentially people organizing to change the laws of the land. Uh, uh, and now, recently, you've had a bit of the backlash, uh, and particularly with the conservative Supreme Court stripping away some of that. But, but for example, the 1965 Voting Rights Act is one of the, you know, one of the most profound pieces of legislation in terms of the rights of uh, black people in this country. So there's there's no question about that. If you look at India, for example, you have a very active uh, Supreme Court there uh, that often has been the vehicle through which uh, people have managed to get an otherwise unresponsive bureaucracy on, in the executive uh, and a kind of distracted, corrupt parliament. Uh, so, the, the, so a kind of unresponsive bureaucracy and a distracted, corrupt parliament 
have uh, have not been able to meet people's needs, and people have have uh, resorted, particularly to the Supreme Court, uh, which has been a very professional, very very uh, you know independent and uh, and uh, in, you know court with integrity, and a lot of changes happened. So nakubaliana na kabisa kwamba this could be a pathway that can be can be very promising. So why has it not happened more in, in, in Tanzania? Uh, you know, why don't we have more of them, tequilas or maybe even the gumis? Um, and I, I think uh, a couple of things. One is you, you need an institutional base uh, to do some of these things. And uh, if, so this, for example, in my, in my day job here in the US, this is, this is what we support. We support lots of groups. If you heard yesterday, one of the biggest victories, I don't know how much you guys follow U.S. politics by living here, but one of the biggest victories was, was the court finding that, the, uh, that the, in North Carolina, uh, uh, that the ways in which they had set up the voting, voting uh, uh, procedures there were essentially uh, racist. And uh, that was a huge victory in the court. So, but in order for that, you know, that was years of work by organizations like the <clears throat> ACLU, the NAACP, and many, many others uh, that groups like Ford have been supporting for decades and many others. So uh, in, in order for while the tequila story suggests that, you know, a kind of maverick individual can do it, uh, in practice, I think what you need is, is institutions with the capacity and the legal expertise uh, to do this, and and we don't really have that in 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 our country, and we need to build that. Uh, the other final point I would make is, you know, the um, the the role of law uh, in a place like Tanzania is very different than than the role of law uh, even in a place like Kenya, uh, or, or and let alone the U.S. and Europe and so forth. And I think. In, in our country, we have such a tenuous link that depending on what it is, um, it, it may be more or less useful. So if what you're trying to do is to say, change the rules of the game, say something like, uh, can independent, can you have independent candidates? Uh, is it constitutional to have, you know, to not have independent candidates, like the tequila case? Um, I think, I think then law is better suited for that because it's, it's about changing the rules of the game. If it's about implementation, uh, is the government doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, is it fulfilling its obligations in terms of particularly the social, uh, economic, cultural rights? Uh, then I think in a place like uh, our country, it's very, very hard. Uh, because we, we basically are not governed through a rule of law process uh, in terms of implementation. Um, so, and, and a good example is this child uh, marriage thing. I mean, I know that there's a challenge to that ruling, so let's see how the challenge goes. But also, so we, let's say the rule is passed, uh, the, the law is, is upheld. Um, uh, do we really be, I mean, it's, I'm in not, in not in any way trying to belittle that, but the main drivers of early child marriage are other things. Uh, and there are many other laws we have, for example, around child labor and so forth, that that we are not uh, that are not being respected right now. So, so in short, what I'm trying to say is that we need to ask ourselves what it is we are trying to achieve. And in some cases, I think the answer will be strategic litigation. In many cases, it will be other things that are more important. And in virtually all cases, in an ideal world, it will be a combination of these things in which the role of strategic litigation may be smaller or, or bigger. Thank you very much. We do have two more questions. We are at the top of the hour, though. One was a comment from Dr. Luca Shalua of Mount Eagle College and University, and he just wanted you to know, Rakesh, that he really enjoyed the talk very much and found it to be very educational. So, Asantisana. The second question, follow-up follow question that Patrick Nicola had um, around um, educational system. We are at 12 o'clock, so Rakesh, I will ask, do you have a minute or two more? Just yeah, I can say about five more minutes if needed. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's do five more minutes so we can get this question in. So his question is, so do you think we need to create an adult educational agency that will focus on educating adults in Tanzania? Uh, uh, I haven't studied this issue in depth, so you should uh, take that as a caveat. So what I'm about to say I may be completely wrong about and change my mind once I think about it more. Uh, but but my short sense, my short answer, my gut feeling is no, um, because um, you know the, the un, unlike children, where you can kind of get them to come to one place, and we have this incredible infrastructure of schooling and so forth. Um, with adults, it's different. Um, uh, I mean, you know, and I'm what I'm worried about is. Here's what I'm worried about, that if we create an agency without first being clear what it is we're trying to do and understanding deeply what the problem is and then understanding deeply what the solution needs to be, uh, what we'll do is just create another bureaucracy. Uh, lots of money and time will go into that. Uh, people will participate and get something and get a nice big certificate at the end of it. But, but nothing of substance will have been achieved. Um, and, and our problem in Tanzania right now is, is not so much to do more things, but to do the things we've already committed to better, uh, to do fewer things uh, better. Now, in a way, I'm a, I, my, my answer is not very satisfactory because if, if you believe, and I think Patrick is right to believe that adult education really matters, then we, it's not good enough to say, well, an agency won't work, so let's not do it. Uh, the question is, what do you do? And to me, I, I think um, the, the, the answer is a kind of more deeper political civil society challenge, which, is, which is, goes back to the points I was making on organizing. I think, I think the, profound, uh, the profound challenge we face in Tanzania, which, by the way, is really also the same challenge we face in many other parts. If you look at what happened with Brexit, if you look at both the rise, but also in many ways the ultimate failure of the Arab Spring, if you look at the rise of Trumpism in this country, uh, what you have is you have people, often people who are uh, who who are not very well educated, maybe who are just struggling in this new world. Uh, the the blue collar jobs are not giving you decent wages anymore. The jobs are not even there, um, and and you have a so the, the, in a sense, the social compact is not working. Uh, it may be working for people like us, uh, but it's not working for many such people. And I think just throwing an adult education agency won't do it. But what what is needed is is a deeper kind of organizing among ourselves, uh, where we come together and we take responsibility along the lines I mentioned in my seven points. And as part of that, I think how we educate ourselves or how we analyze our situation will be will have to be part of the answer uh, and the models may vary you know uh, perhaps the bandwidth uh, internet bandwidth is going to grow and is accessible if it's not already will soon be that allows us to learn in new ways uh, that don't require the kind of traditional model of an agency um, certainly lots of Kenyans are doing it I'm part of a, something called a, I mean, anyway, I'm part of a MOOCs program uh, run out of UC Berkeley, where I teach some courses, and uh, we see a lot of uptake. Less, not so much in Tanzania, but uh, a lot in Kenya, a lot in Nigeria, a lot in India, a lot in South Africa. Uh, so we may come up with models like that, but the key is people will have to first organize. So the communities will first need to organize, and then we'll find the pathway. So. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That let's not start with the agency. Let's start with organizing people, um, and and then we and then we seek the solutions we need to solve the problems we have collectively identified and chosen to pursue. Thank you, Rakesh. And what a powerful way to end the session. Start with the simple thing, which is organizing the people. So we definitely appreciate the the, the discussion. I do have one more comment from the floor from David and Rema, and he also says to you, thank you for this great informative session. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. So then, 
I, I just wanted, before we hang up, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for for joining uh, and Jessica for organizing it and Liu and Guy for getting me involved in the first place uh, uh, and all this encouragement to, to, en to engage with you from the beginning. It's, it's a pleasure. I miss home, I, so this is one nice way of, uh, of connecting. So, asante nisan and ashkuru, and I hope we continue the conversation. Absolutely, and we cannot thank you enough for this wonderful session. And I have from the floor from Patrick Calamera and Asema. Hello, Mr. Rajani. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Asante, Pia. Yeah. Yeah. So clearly, just from the responses that we're getting from the audience, and even the fact that we went over, it shows that this is a timely and and much needed discussion. I think you've given us a lot of food to. So we truly appreciate it. Um, we did record this session, so we will make it available for those attendees that um, were not able to participate. And um, we hope to continue this discussion going forward. So once again, um, Rakesh Rajani, thank you so much for joining us today, for enriching us and sharing us with us ways that we can change not only here, not only starting with the big things, but also just individually. <coughs> And um, finally, just for all the participants, we want to thank you for, for, for attending and to let you know that on, on Monday, August 1st, we're going to have a session about what it means to be a leader within Daikota. That will be through Bandio. And um, that will be at 5 p.m. Eastern. And on August 13th, NH, NHC National Housing Corporation will be with us to discuss investment opportunities in Tanzania. So stay tuned. And before we uh, sign off, Yungai, did you have anything that you would like to add? Karibu. Asante Sana, I just wanted to um, re reiterate the gratitude uh, we have towards you, Rakesh, for being with us today. Um, and really a meaningful presentation and responses to questions. If I may just quickly recap the seven lessons, just give me 30 seconds. I know some folks joined a little late. Um, people organize, the first one, people organizing um, needs leadership, people taking initiative. The second one, take responsibility. Change begins with us. The third, be a true listener because you care, not just for self-interest. Fourth, change cannot be individuals. It's about collective action, people coming together. Fifth, show a pathway of action. It has to be real, grounded in reality. Six. Focus on how target entities can work better for us, example, government, not just overthrowing such entity. Um, and then seventh and last, having humility. You don't have all the answers, having mechanisms to get feedback. Um, and Rakesh also responded to questions or expanded on comments related to engaging leaders, media's role, status of adult education in Tanzania, and change through the judicial um, system. So. Thank you, Rakesh, again. Thank you, Jessica, for coordinating and everybody for joining. And hopefully, um, we'll, many of you will join us on Monday during the Bandio show. Asante Nisana, and this now concludes the call. Asante Rungai for helping us close out the call. Happy morning.